Hello, this is Little Green Ghouls and welcome back to Goosebumps Revisited, a series where I break down a classic Goosebumps book and any episode that goes along with it. I will also be totaling up some of our Goosebumps cliches and classic moments. This week I'm excited to visit My Best Friend is Invisible. I didn't know what to expect going into this book because all I could recall from the episode was eyes on the back of someone's head. That being said, this book was pretty terrible. It commits the worst crime, and that's that it's incredibly boring. It has a ridiculous ending that feels like a desperate attempt to save the book, but it doesn't work. If you never read this one, you aren't missing anything. The 1997 cover is nothing special. I think Jacobus did what he could with an invisible boy, and I do enjoy how shocked the cat looks. It's just not one of my favorites, so I guess it suits the book. I like the 2007 slime border color pairings because it reminds me of bubblegum. I think it makes the cat pop out more too, but really that's all I have to say about it. This book was featured on a trading card book tearout, and that's the only thing I found this week for merchandise. In the back of the book, we have an advertisement for two different 1998 Goosebumps calendars. The first features a picture of a month along with a different scratch and sniff for each month that included dog breath, rotten eggs, and sweaty socks according to the cover. I'm not sure I'd consider those smells selling points. The second calendar is a Scare Day style, and based off of what I found, these Scare Day calendars were pretty cool. They often had Goosebumps themed jokes and riddles that I probably would have enjoyed solving, even though they typically seem to just be the title of the book. Our front tag says, Not seeing is believing, which is a play on the phrase, seeing is believing. Our back tag says, He's out of sight, for real. And as is the case for most of these tags that contain, for real, not really sure we needed it, but let's check out the blurb on the back. Sammy Jacobs is into ghosts and science fiction, not exactly the smartest hobby, at least not if you ask Sammy's parents. They're research scientists and they only believe in real science, but now Sammy's met somebody who's totally unreal. He's hanging out in Sammy's room and eating his cereal at breakfast. Sammy's got to find a way to get rid of his new friend. Only problem is, Sammy's new friend is invisible. Okay, let's start the summary. The book opens with our introduction to Sammy Jacobs, who's all about ghosts and science fiction and he's currently at the dinner table fantasizing about being invisible. He even says, I tried to picture how I would look if I were invisible. I don't think there's much to picture Sammy, that's kind of the point. I guess the invisibility lines are blurred for Sammy because he saw some knockoff version of the Invisible Man film where the invisible guy in it had a see-through digestive process, so you could see the food digesting in his stomach, like those cows with the ports in their sides. Huh? We then learn Sammy's parents are classic Goosebump scientists, and their specialty is weird things with lights and lasers. Goosebump scientists are one cliche I wish I would have counted in hindsight. Sammy thinks his parents are boring because all they do is come home and talk about their work. Stein then repeats this sentence three times in a row to emphasize how boring these parents are, but all it accomplished was making me think I was having a stroke. Sammy has a younger brother Simon, who is the good one. Serious Simon never does anything wrong and Sammy resents him for it. He also wants to be a scientist just like his parents because, according to Sammy, he's a little nerd. We have a brief exchange involving spaghetti between the brothers, which results in the mother slipping in it. It's early in the book, but I'm already not enjoying it. There's just something about the tone that screams scattered mess. Sammy and his parents then have an argument over the existence of ghosts, and Sammy employs the fallacy of appealing to tradition, where he insists that since people have always believed in ghosts, they must be real. Sammy's scientist parents don't have time for this nonsense, though and are probably disappointed in their son deep down. Sammy eventually heads up to his bedroom, where we get a half-assed chapter cliffhanger with Sammy walking in his room and gasping at his homework papers scattered all over the floor in an open window. It's terrifying stuff. Brutus, Sammy's orange cat, is in the middle of the papers and seems to be scared by something unknown. And that's really the highlight of these next few pages. His friend Roxanne stops by and we learn she's hyper-competitive. Sammy and Roxanne are going to be competing together in the school's mini Olympics next week, so I'm sure invisible shenanigans will be taking place there. Roxanne and Sammy then shift the conversation to their term project for English class, and they're trying to think of ideas. Sammy suggests studying the life cycle of a moth or how much water plants need, but Roxanne thinks those are too babyish. I figured the complaint would be they sound more like science fair projects than English projects, but nope. Instead, they settle on researching ghosts and want to investigate a local haunted house. Roxanne wants Sammy to videotape her interviewing a ghost, which again is convenient for our invisibility book and not an English project. The kids are then interrupted by mysterious moans and a strange light in the hallway. Is it a ghost? No, it's Sammy's dad holding a laser light because science and because he couldn't pass up the opportunity to mock his child's interests. This laser light ends up being called a molecule detector light, and it's like an x-ray that can see all kinds of insects and things you can't normally see. 
This sounds like solid science. And G, I wonder what Sam would use this for in a book centered on invisibility. Everyone leaves the room and then Sammy trips, but when he looks to see what's there, he sees nothing. FYI, Stein thought this moment was worthy of a chapter cliffhanger. He then drifts off to sleep, but is quickly awoken by an open window, which freaks him out because he knows he shredded earlier. We then jump to the next morning, and Sammy oversleeps because Brutus the cat didn't wake him up like usual. We then find out Brutus slept in Simon's room, which is highly unusual because Simon hates Brutus. Cats do what they want, so this moment wouldn't even register to me as unusual. Sammy returns to the breakfast table, and Stein fires off another lackluster cliffhanger, because in the time Sammy went up to Simon's room to find Brutus, someone ate his cereal. The horror. Sammy is insistent something is wrong because the spoon is also on the wrong side of the bowl, but his parents just laugh and say he's been reading too many ghost stories. Sammy heads to school, and once in math class, he has to go up to the chalkboard to solve some homework equations, but he sucks at math. That's probably the scariest part of the book so far. While struggling with the math, Sammy suddenly feels hot breath on his neck and something warm and clammy grabs his hand. He then feels his hand being forced to write something before freaking out and fleeing the classroom. Sammy ends up telling himself that maybe he has read too many ghost stories. Once back at home, we have the exact scene from the cover where Sammy walks in on a floating piece of pizza and Brutus standing with his hair on end. Sammy then begins interrogating the invisible presence and wants to know who it is. It doesn't answer and Sammy just stands there watching this slice of pizza slowly getting eaten in the air. Sammy's mom enters the room and then chastises him for eating half a pizza before dinner. As Sammy is leaving to clean his room, he sees Brutus floating in the air, but when Sammy's mom turns around, Brutus is safely back on the kitchen chair. Once in his room, Sammy is furious to see somebody has trashed it. There's half-eaten food all over, which includes peanut butter and jelly smeared on his comforter, and spaghetti in his sheets. His mom walks in and is livid at the mess. She tells Sammy to clean it up and to skip dinner because he's clearly had enough to eat. As Sammy is angrily cleaning, we finally get to meet this invisible boy. A voice from nowhere suddenly says, come on, let's clean this mess up. And Sammy watches in horror as boxes of garbage start floating into the trash bag. We learn this boy is Brent Green and he's not a ghost. He's just been invisible as long as he can remember, and he doesn't know why his parents left him at Sammy's house. Brent keeps insisting he just wants to be Sammy's friend, but Sammy rightfully has his suspicions. Simon then enters the room and sits on the chair Brent is in before Sammy can stop him, but Brent is quick and yanks the chair out from underneath Simon, which results in him crashing to the floor. This is somehow Sammy's fault according to Simon, and he storms off to tattle. Sammy then has some important questions for Brent. Can he walk through walls? No. Is he dressed? Yes. Does that mean anything Brent touches also becomes invisible? No. I just suspect Stein didn't want to write about naked 12 year olds running around. Kinda like in Let's Get Invisible. Sammy also wants to know if Brent can turn him invisible, but he can't. Roxanne stops by, and we have way too many pages of Brent holding up objects behind Roxanne, while Sammy begs her to turn around. Roxanne makes it through an entire chapter not noticing Brent's various floating items, and she leaves. Sammy then yells at Brent for not introducing himself to Roxanne, but gets no response and wonders if Brent is gone for good. We jump to the next morning, and Brent is still nowhere to be found. Sammy walks to school, and he eventually concludes that Brent could possibly be dangerous, and maybe a ghost who just wants to possess his body or something, so Sammy is kinda glad he's gone. At school, we get one of the lamest pranks and goosebumps. Sammy is horrified when he noticed all the kids in the hallway seem to be talking to invisible people in a chapter cliffhanger, but really, Roxanne just told everybody to act like they were talking to invisible people, and the entire school agreed to go along with it to prank Sammy, which is very believable. This prank carries over into English class, where even the teacher makes a joke about invisible friends at Sammy's expense. During lunch, Sammy hides in the library and sneaks a sandwich, even though food is strictly forbidden in the library. This is important to know because of course Brent appears and begins eating Sammy's sandwich and talking loudly about how he's been lonely in the bedroom. This results in Sammy almost getting in trouble for both talking and eating in the library. However, the librarian seems more concerned that Sammy is talking to himself and recommends he chats with a guidance counselor or something. It then jumps to the mini olympics, and again, gee, I wonder what will happen here. We spend way too many pages getting all the details of race excitement before it's Sammy's turn to run in the relay race. Sammy is doing great in the race when he hears Brent nearby. Brent then says he's going to prove what a great friend he is by lifting Sammy up mid-race, and I guess running with him? It gives the appearance that Sammy is flying, but, like, how slow is Sammy that Brent can run faster while carrying him? It's stupid. Sammy starts to thrash around, which results in Brent tripping, so Sammy and the baton tumble across the field and they lose the race. Roxanne is pissed Brent lost the race and calls him a stupid clumsy cretin. All of this recent drama leaves Sammy thinking he must do something about Brent before he ruins his life even further. We're well past the halfway point, and this book is just freaking boring, because it's entirely too predictable. Stein should have left it at Let's Get Invisible, because even then he was struggling with what to do with invisible kids. 
besides just picking up things and making them float. At least that book had the benefit of evil mirror twins. We then have a chapter at home where Sammy begs Brent to leave, but he won't. Sammy then asks his parents for help, and they don't believe him. Sammy then ends the chapter with a brilliant plan to get rid of Brent. It's all really boring to be quite frank. This brilliant plan isn't much better. He feeds Brent some leftover fried chicken from dinner, and then starts saying what a great cook Roxanne's mom is, and how Brent should be her best friend. This goes nowhere though because Brent doesn't want to be friends with a girl. What a brilliant plan. Sammy finally snaps and tells Brent to get out because he doesn't want to be his friend and he's ruining his life. Brent does not take kindly to this and changes his entire tone. He then angrily asks Sammy what he's going to do if he refuses to leave, and then grabs Sammy and pushes him towards an open window in a chapter cliffhanger. Sammy breaks free and Brent just insists he was playing around, but Sammy is unconvinced. Sammy then goes on to rehash the events of the book at Brent, because Stein doesn't know what else to talk about and I guess we have pages to fill. Eventually, Sammy's mom enters the room and surprised Brent won't talk to her, so she thinks Sammy is losing it too. He then ends the chapter with another brilliant idea to get rid of Brent. Hopefully it's better than just suggesting dinner at Roxanne's house. Sammy turns up the heat as high as he can in the house and shuts all the windows. He even turns on the shower as hot as it can go, with the goal of making the house so unbearably hot for Brent, because I guess we're just supposed to pretend that Brent can't walk around the house opening windows and turning down the thermostat. But we're suspending logic because it works. Brent thinks it's too hot, opens a window, and seemingly leaves the house. We hop to Saturday where Sammy and Roxanne are off to the haunted house for their English project. Once again, gosh, I wonder what will happen there. This haunted house's gimmick is that its hedges grow tall and fast, so it blocks out all the light in the windows. If the hedges are cut, they quickly grow back again, just as high. Yep, that's what makes it haunted. Once inside the house, Sammy forgot a flashlight, but he did remember a camcorder. They spend some time exploring the abandoned house, and it's like every haunted house Stein has taken us in so far. Eventually, they hear footsteps, and furniture starts to float around the room, because the ghost is ready for its interview, I guess. The ghost ends up throwing dusty sheets at them, and eventually gets a hold of Roxanne, causing the camera to crash to the floor. The ghost spins her around the room, and eventually launches her into a wall. The pillow then floats up and begins to smother Roxanne. This all may have been interesting, if it wasn't so clearly Brent. Stein has made Sammy incredibly stupid though, so he thinks it's a ghost. This goes on for an entire chapter, with Ghost Brent tormenting the two kids and literally choking Sammy out before Roxanne is able to save him and pull him out of the haunted house. The two kids race home without stopping in complete terror of this haunted house. This has been painfully boring to read through, like it's easily the most predictable Goosebumps book so far, and I've complained about many things in these books, predictable is usually not one of them. Once in his room, Sammy sits on his bed and is horrified because the ghost is back. Just kidding, it's Brent, because of course it fucking is, who the hell else would it be? Sammy starts screaming at Brent to leave, when Sammy's dad appears in the doorway, he lets Sammy know that he's too old for an invisible friend. Sammy insists that he's real, and his dad promises they'll get rid of him together. The chapter then ends with Sammy and his dad walking down the stairs, and then Sammy starts freaking out and demanding to know where they're going. I don't think walking down the stairs in my own home with my dad would get this kind of reaction out of me, but whatever, I guess we needed another chapter cliffhanger. It turns out, his dad is going to take him to the doctor. I was thinking of a psychologist, like in Piano Lessons Can Be Murder. Before they can leave though, Roxanne is at the door, and now that the danger is passed, she thinks the haunted house trip was actually awesome. Sammy's dad starts jingling the car keys because it's time to go to the doctor, but Simon interrupts and is like, you can't go. I need help coming up with a new topic on my science project, and he'll still be crazy tomorrow. The dad agrees with this logic and then promises they'll take Sammy to the doctor tomorrow. It's hard to emphasize just how shitty the writing at the end of this book is. Like, zero effort is being made for things to flow in any sort of natural manner. Sammy then remembers the molecule detector light and races upstairs with it to prove Brent's existence. Everyone gathers in Sammy's room as he frantically scans it with the magic light. He can't find Brent at first, until a voice from the closet begs not to be found. This shocks everyone, and when Sammy flings the closet door open, he screams, You're a monster! in a chapter cliffhanger. The next chapter is in the Hall of Fame for Trash Endings, which really suits this book, I guess. Sammy shines the light on Brent, and what is this hideous beast? A human. Brent is a human, and Sammy is the monster. Brent explains his parents made him invisible, so he'd have a better chance at survival. Sammy and his family are apparently covered in suction pods, antenna, tendrils, and have multiple eyes. Simon wants to keep Brent as a science project, but the dad suggests they take him to the zoo because humans are an endangered species. And that's how this one ends. An incredibly tedious book to slog through, with an ending that screams, I know this book sucks. Here's a nonsense ending so I can pretend it was something more. We're getting to the end of this series, but still have a handful of episodes to go. This one I have faint memories of, mostly around eyes on the back of people's heads, so I'm really curious to see what that was all about. 
but let's jump into the episode. This definitely feels like a goosebump science moment. If we increase the cathode charge, we might get a cleaner morphic image. It looks like we're sneaking into the haunted house right from the start with this adaptation. Boy, I never knew hedges could get this big. Why do you think they call it hedge house? Um, <laughs> calm down, Sammy. The legend says there is a ghost and we are going in. Oh. I'm wondering if this is going to be Brent or if the episode is going to go full ghost. <laughs> Roxanne! I have no patience for this kind of reasoning. I'd be out of that house in two seconds. Must be some kind of breeze up here. The ghost wants to be a star. It's a chair. Boo. I'm ready for my close-up. I'm out of here. I think we're just abandoning the book at this point. <laughs> we just jump cut, leaving the haunted house after the commercial break. I mean this. Get that thing away from me! It's a rubber mask, Sam. I can't figure out what the perspective is supposed to be here. Mom? Dad? The ghost likes Cracker Barrel. <laughs> I love these static ball things. Mom? Dad? I feel like we're going to tie the parents more into the plot this time. It's for seeing things that are hard to see. Look, I've told you more than I should already. Oh, so it's the ghost perspective after all. It's me. This episode goes heavy on the lurking shots. Time for some floating shit special effects. So we are going with ghost possibly. Yes, I'm the ghost of Hedge House. Maybe we could be friends. Friends with a, a ghost? Time for more floating shit. Hey, good hands. I had the same thought when I read his name. Of course, because there's so many ghosts that are named Brent. More floaty special effects. So the next time you get a great idea for a wedding, do me a favor and call- Goosebumps loves a school lunchroom scene. <laughs> Oops. No! No! That's a satisfying plop. Uh, uh, uh. It looks like a crack den, not a ghost bedroom. Looks like somebody lives here. Brent just won't take no for an answer. Leave me alone! You can't keep me out. You got me enough trouble! I knew the parents would have more to do this time. I knew there was some out there. I just never thought they'd come here. We better do something about it. Stay where you are, Sam. Be careful, Dad! Oh, so he is a human. The eyes on the back of the head I remember must be a monster thing. Uh -huh. It's a human, Sam. Human? I thought there weren't any more humans. Why did you take over our planet? It's all right, Brent. Okay, this is what I remember being disturbed by. We won't hurt you, Brent. Overall, I thought My Best Friend is Invisible was probably the weakest book since Legend of the Lost Legend, and I may have hated this book even more than I hated that one. I found this book to be weirdly predictable at every single stage, which made for a very boring read, which is the worst thing a Goosebumps book can be. I just really don't get why Stein revisited Invisibility when it was clear he didn't have anything to add that he didn't already do better in Let's Get Invisible. The supposed ghost portion of the story was rendered useless and felt just as tacked on as the ending twist because it's so obviously Brent the whole time. The entire book was just a series of predictable events laid out in the first couple chapters. The twist at the end almost felt insulting, like sorry this book sucked, here's a wild ending to erase the previous hundred pages of tedious garbage. I don't think this book should have made it to print. I'm gonna give this one, one out of five, molecule detector lights. I found this story actively annoying to read. Like, I was legit frustrated by the end and just wanted it to be over. Okay, now that that's off my chest, on to our totals. My best friend is invisible, didn't have any vomit, shoulder scares, asshole victims, or it was only a dreams, but it did have some 90s moments. In Getting Jiggy with the 90s, we had three 90s moments. These included chalkboards, videotape cameras, and corn pop cereal. 
I think they still make corn pops, but it felt like they had their moment in the 90s. This raises our Goosebumps series total to 174 jiggy 90s moments. There were four pranks in My Best Friend is Invisible. These included a dad ghost scare, Brent yanking a chair, a hallway prank, and a haunted house prank. This raises our series total to 130 pranks. My Best Friend is Invisible had chapter cliffhangers that were harder to count than usual because they were often so lackluster it was like, is that supposed to be suspenseful? It ended up with a total of 13 chapter cliffhangers. This raises our Goosebumps series total to 704. The clunky award this week has to go to chapters 3 to 4, where Sammy trips over nothing, and it's like, wait, was that really the cliffhanger we're going with, Stein? Shocker ending. Our big twist to this book was when it's revealed Brent is a human and everybody else are monsters. Maybe if this book wasn't so shitty, the ending twist would have landed, but I hated it. This raises our Goosebumps series total to 48. Well, that's it for my best friend is invisible. The more I think about this book, the more I dislike it. Next week is Deep Trouble 2, and I'm pretty sure we can only go up from here. Let me know in the comments what you thought of My Best Friend is Invisible. Am I being too harsh and just need a nap? Were Brent's parents visible humans? Why was Brent so annoying if he was trying to hide in a monster world? Do you like garbage? Also, what did you think of my invisibility horror clips this week? It was slim pickings for sure, but I tried my best. Anyways, as always, thanks again for watching, and make sure you subscribe for... The Brad. The Love.